My name is Mary Lloyd Ireland and I prepared, saw most of these cases, and we'll be presenting this on acute knee ligament injuries in athletes. This was a Division I football athlete who was crushed during a game and had a posterior cruciate ligament tear with severe straight posterior instability. Classifications of instabilities are very important. The reason that we don't use what structure has been injured as a deficient problem is that it doesn't tell us what the functional instability is and the functional problem that the individual has. So we can see straight instabilities, we can see rotatory instabilities, or we can see combined instabilities. So in individuals who are said to have an ACL deficient knee, the classification from a functional disability problem is an anterolateral rotatory instability indicating that the direction is anterior, that the tibia comes, and it's the lateral tibial plateau that rotates. Hence our pivot shift on our exam. And also with the mechanism injury, typically it's a functional pivot shift where somebody lands awkwardly, the tibia anteriorly translates Basically, they dislocate their knee, have a typical bone bruise pa pattern of the lateral tibial plateau and mid portion of the, medi of the lateral femoral condyle. So think about the mechanisms. What the patient is going to have is a functional disability to better understand the importance and the function of ligaments and also what we need to do to make a diagnosis by physical exam and what we need to do surgically. The pure cruciate ligament, the injury mechanism, in sports is typically low velocity, there's a blow to the anterior tibia, or there's a fall with the foot plantar flexed, the force when the ground hits the proximal tibia is right there. If the foot's dorsiflexed, then they'll probably have a patellar event, patella fracture or contusion. We base our exam on one, two, and three grades on the AMA classification. One plus, less than one millimeter, two plus, 5 to 10 millimeters, 3 plus 10 to 15 millimeters, 4 plus is a gross as an instability, um, a gross instability or dislocation. So we give pluses to the exam and then our diagnosis is a grade 1, 2, 3. The importance of grading certain ligament injuries such as a PCL and an MCL is that they tend to tighten up as opposed to an anterior cruciate ligament um, injury. Assess the collateral ligaments. Got to think about a posterior lateral instability with an ACL tear. We see greater tibial external rotation with a posterior lateral instability as diagnosed by a reverse pivot shift, opening in varus, stress testing at 30 degrees, external rotation recurvatum, or in a prone exam, a positive dial test. Acute reconstructions we want to do in knee dislocations. Grade 3 collateral ligament injuries where we can repair these, hopefully then doing a reconstruction and osteotomy. Straight PCL injuries will be treated non-operatively. However, if there are associated instabilities of the collateral ligaments, posterior lateral corner, all of these need to be addressed. This is our offensive lineman who had a complete posterior cruciate ligament tear and straight posterior instability. Fortunately, he was an isolated grade 3 instability, did not have collateral ligament injury, posterior lateral corner or medial side. You can see where he hit the ground uh, of his proximal tibia, posterior dislocated. This is what the posterior dislocation looks like in his exam under anesthesia. He had a PCL reconstruction with bone patellar tendon bone graft. When we think about a posterior cruciate ligament exam for an injury, feel the medial tibial plateaus. They normally are 5 to 8 millimeters anterior to the medial femoral condyles. If they have a PCL injury, that tibia will be dropped back. So when you go to do your anterior drawer, you'll think it may be ACL, but it's actually PCL because the proximal tibia is in a posterior position. This is a dislocation. These occur all too often on a Friday evening. These injuries oftentimes don't hurt 
if you witness it or a coach or a trainer or a parent witnesses it and it looks ugly and they have no pain, think the worst. This is a knee dislocation where the only thing remaining is his medial skin in the upper right. So the skin has actually sucked into the joint because the superficial and deep medial collateral ligament structures are injured. ACL, PCL inj is injured. So he has a knee dislocation and combined instabilities of the medial side being out, PCL being out, ACL being out. His posterior lateral corner, however, was okay. The reason that these don't hurt is that the capsule is injured, the blood leaks out of the joint, and there really isn't any sensation of the capsule because of a tense hemarthrosis that causes pain. So typically they don't have pain and this is an injury that you really want to make sure the neurovascular status, the pulses are present and do indices for vascular compromise. This is individual surgical um, exposure. All we did was make a skin incision the arrow is on the medial meniscus, and you can see that there's nothing attached to the medial meniscus. The deep capsular ligaments, the meniscofemoral and meniscotibial ligaments, have been uh, shredded, pulled from that rim of the meniscus. Fortunately, they are repairable. He had an ACL, PCL reconstruction done with uh, autograft and a deep capsular repair medially and went on to do very well. This is a surgical approach. Again, doing the repair, we used um, bone patellar tendon bone for his ACL reconstruction and repaired his PCL. In this day and time, we wouldn't necessarily make as big an exposure, but this is an excellent example of what happens with a knee dislocation. Basically, it's an explosion, and these can be put back together in vigorous range of motion afterward because certainly there is a lot of potential problem with arthrofibrosis in these knee dislocations. Acute knee dislocations are uncommon, but they may be underdiagnosed. If you're covering a uh, football game on a Friday and you see someone who you feel has had an anterior dislocation or a posterior dislocation or a multi-ligament knee injury, you should call the emergency room, make sure they have um, an ability to do a vascular workup. If the knee opens up to varus valgus stress testing and extension, it is a knee dislocation until proven otherwise. Direction can be anterior and a hyperextension mechanism, posterior with a direct blow to the um, uh, anterior proximal tibia. This is an example of a knee dislocation. Uh, he wasn't really hit at his knee, but you can see how his cleat stays put and he's tackled. He went to an emergency room locally in Pennsylvania. So you can see here. He's tackled, is brought down to the ground. He had no pain. He went to the emergency room. X-rays were negative. He was sent home. He had a knee dislocation, ended up with a popliteal artery injury that required a Gore-Tex graft, permanent foot drop, external fixator for his stabilization for his knee, and basically a knee injury that changed his life forever. This was 18 years ago, so certainly a long time ago, but this still does happen. Again, if you're the physician covering this event, you should call ahead to the emergency room, make sure that the parents or the ambulance take the individual to a facility that has the facilities to do vascular assessments, indices, arteriograms, MR, and they have a protocol for knee dislocation. So it doesn't happen often, but don't miss it. Best time to get a good exam is on the sideline. Make sure you examine their pulses, their calf, their perineal nerve. The facility of choice to get them to would be somewhere that has a protocol for knee dislocations. This is one who had a knee dislocation. This is two days after his injury. You can see where he can do a leg lift ask the patient to bend their knee. They're not going to hurt themselves by bending their knee and you can get a better sense for what you'll be able to do with the exam. So he has a posterior drawer, 
a lateral tibial plateau that goes posterior lateral. His proximal tib fib joint is normal. He has an ACL and a PCL injury. You can see the ecchymosis where the fluid has leaked through the capsular uh, in, uh, rent. So do an anterior drawer in neutral internal external rotation. He has dropped back, has a complete posterior cruciate ligament tear. Examine the opposite side for comparison, varus, valgus in 0 and 30 degrees. And then on this side, an extension he opens up, indicating a PCL involvement. At 30 degrees, he opens up even more. Use the butt of your hand uh, on his lateral femoral condyle for, for valgus stress testing. Opens up an extension. And then this is another way that you can do a Lachman that's positive on endpoint. And then you can also do a reverse Lachman. And then in varus, he also opens up. So in knee dislocation, fortunately, neurologically, he was intact. And vascularly, he was intact. Unstable in knee extension. Think about a knee dislocation. This can be either varus or valgus at zero degrees. And sometime in 30 degrees flexion on varus stress testing, there'll be a little bit of opening, but not on valgus stress testing. And compare it to your good side. Knee dislocations occur in collegiate sports. This next video clip shows a knee dislocation. If the foot is pointing the opposite direction from the other foot, that is a knee dislocation until proven otherwise. We'll listen to these announcers. They call it uh, pretty well, but also watch what the athlete does with their head and face. If it's an ACL tear only, oftentimes they will bring their knee to their chest, the heart attack of the knee, so to speak, for an ACL tear. However, if they put their hands over their face and start pounding the ground, oftentimes that is a knee dislocation, and the athlete in general knows something is wrong. Lattimore wrapped up by Lathers, and the ball came out, but they're going to rule Lattimore down, and Lattimore is hurt. Oh, no. Marcus Lattimore holding his right knee. It was his left knee that he injured last year about this time against Mississippi State. Tore his ACL, uh, missed the rest oh. of the season, and then had the hip injury a couple of weeks ago. Oh, no. This... Right knee injury, hopefully not career ending. In professional uh, football, we see knee dislocations in this Oakland Raider uh, taken down by 49er. You can see where his knee is in 80 degrees of hyperextension. This is a knee dislocation. He did not return to professional sports. Very difficult to come back from a knee dislocation. This is University of Miami. Running back, hit from the front, goes into hyperextension. Kind of a similar mechanism. Had a knee dislocation. So if you see some of these occur on the sidelines, you can get an indication of the severity of the uh, injury and what might be involved if the knee looks grossly deformed, then there probably is a knee dislocation and structures should be identified that were torn. Most of them are due spontaneously. You want to refer to a center with a vascular surgeon. Oftentimes the vascular surgeon take every 12-hour shifts and this is a point that medical legal suits are made. Uh, the orthopedist, family practice um, physicians get sued because the vascular surgeon uh, may not see the patient often enough and may not appreciate that there is indeed a vascular injury. Communicate with your emergency room. Cell phones are good for that. Put a note on the patient. Talk to the parents. Transfer to a facility that has uh, a vascular suite. And if there's a high suspicion, do an arteriogram. 
There are certain protocols for knee dislocation algorithms and make sure wherever you send them does have an ability to look at their vascular status uh, with arteriogram, uh, ABIs, and have the facility make sure they have a protocol for a potential knee dislocation and they may need to be admitted overnight. This is the algorithm for planning for complex knee injuries, including dislocations. Vascular status arteriogram is the gold standard. The injury can be a thrombus. It can be a tear of the enema, partial or complete. Late vascular compromise from a thrombus or a propagation of the intimal tear. This is a six-year-old high school football player. Had a valgus twisting blow to his body. He was unable to keep playing. He was evaluated on the emergency room. Seen in office three days later. He was having a significant amount of calf pain. The x-rays from the ER did not show tib-fib, but if you have an individual who is having calf pain, get an x-ray. Uh, so here was his non-displaced fibula fracture, which explained his calf pain. It wasn't because of a vascular problem. It was more from a fracture bony of the, of the uh, uh, fibula, which is more of a whip kick type level injury from his contact laterally. He had an ACL and an MCL injury. You can see where he, on um, the lateral view, is a little bit uh, like a green stick. On the AP view, you can see the fracture, which explained his calf pain, which was bony and not vascular in nature. This is his MI scan. Uh, shows uh, very well on the scan on the left his medial collateral ligament injury, which was distal. You can see where his uh, medial meniscus was separated um, and and more proximal than it should be, indicating injury to the deep meniscofemoral and meniscotibial medial uh, ligaments. Uh, and then also the superficial tibial collateral ligament was avulsed from the tibia. These are troublesome injuries that need to be fixed acutely. If they're not fixed, oftentimes they will have chronic anteral medial rotator instability, a inability to heal the meniscus. So when we see these acutely, particularly complete avulsions distally of the superficial medial collateral ligament and the deep tibial capsule like this, this should be repaired open. Think about the anatomy of this. This well shows it on the right, the superficial tibial collateral ligament. It attaches very distal. And then the medial meniscus, the meniscotibial ligaments uh, have been avulsed in this case um, and will need to be repaired. Again, the MRI scan showing the um, distal injury to the MCL and the meniscus that is floating more superior because of the deep capsular ligament and the peripheral tear of the meniscus. Lateral view shows the typical tear pattern of the anterior cruciate ligament. By MRI scan, it's typically at that proximal third, distal two-thirds. PCL is intact. T2 images on the right, again demonstrating the uh, ACL injury. This is examiner anesthesia. Injured knee is the left knee. He's stable in extension. As we, bring, as we flex him to 30 degrees, there's significant opening medially, indicating his injury to his superficial and deep collateral ligaments. Don't really see the skin sucking into the joint, um, as in that other individual. If you do a pivot shift, this is his exam under anesthesia. It may not be as significant if you have a medial injury because there's no post to pivot around. Here's his anterior drawer in internal rotation, first in neutral, and then in external rotation. And you can see how he comes forward more in external rotation because of his posterior medial corner injury. When I do a pivot shift on him, it's not as positive as some because he doesn't really have that normal medial structure to rotate around negative reverse pivot shift, positive pivot shift. From the over my shoulder, internal rotation of the tibia, you can do a pivot that way as well. And again, not as an impressive pivot shift because he doesn't have the medial structures intact. He opens in flexion, not in extension. Negative posterior drawer. Positive anterior drawer. 
opposite side. If you do have an opportunity to go to the operating room with the orthopedic surgeon, that's a very helpful time to get skills for knee exam. This is arthroscopic picture. Here is his medial meniscus, if you remember what it looked like on the MRI scan. So there's hemorrhage. You can see the deep capsular ligaments. Different ways to repair the posterior horn detachment can be done. This is an all inside way. There also are bone tunnels that are used. Very important to establish the posterior attachment of the medial meniscus to reestablish those hoop uh, stresses, the normal hoop mechanism of the function of the uh, meniscus. So we bring that down to that hemorrhagic capsule posteriorly. This is a positive drive through as well because there's um, no medial stability so we can get into that compartment relatively well as opposed to what we can when it, the medial compartment is intact. So I'm putting some all inside sutures in here and this is the deep Menisco tibial ligament that you saw injured on the on the MRI scan. So we go ahead and drill our tunnels for our anterior cruciate ligament reconstruction. Use bone patellar tendon bone. Remove that bone that we've reamed. Pick the anatomic spot on the femur and on the tibia. I'll pass my graft and wait to tie the graft down until we've done the medial reconstruction. Here's the interference screw fit on the femur. ACL is reestablished. And then here's our bone coming out of the tibial tunnel. Before tying that down, we'll put sutures in in a modified inside out. That's the uh, deep tibial capsular ligament there and you can see the superficial tibial collateral ligament that was avulsed from the tibia. So you have two levels of the uh, deep capsule and more superficial capsule. And an open medial repair was done on this medial collateral ligament superficially. with an anchor into the proximal tibia. Pass the sutures arthroscopically and then do a medial approach for the repair. Localizing this outside in allows you to have a smaller incision than we showed in the knee dislocation. And this is localizing the uh, medial uh, meniscus from the outside in and then doing a mini open approach for the MCL repair. Again, the tear was distal, tibial attachment. The sutures up above are my sutures going from inside to outside, modified open approach to repair the meniscus. And then this is the superficial tibial collateral ligament. Pulling on the meniscus right now. You can see the deep capsular ligament where that was, um, was torn, uh, which goes along with his clinical and MR findings. And then distally, this is the superficial tibial collateral ligament. So we repair the deep capsular ligament using the modified inside out, and then I use sutures to repair it back down to the deep capsule. And then this is the superficial tibial collateral ligament that I put back with uh, drill holes um, and an anchor in the proximal tibia. This elite gymnast has done this floor routine many times. Watch her landing. So she tore ACL, knees, goes to her chest. We'll replay this, but if you look at the way she's landing, she gets a little off in the air and lands with her body forward, her hip internally rotated, adducted putting her knee into valgus, her tibia is externally rotated, and she's pronated. No MCL injury, no patellar dislocation, anterior cruciate ligament tear. 
When does she tear ACL? By the time it looks ugly, she definitely has torn it. Here she's torn her ACL, and the valgus is really more where the tibia is anteriorly dislocating in a functional pivot shift maneuver. And then as she flexes her knee back, the knee relocates. She brings her tibia posteriorly, and the IT band kicks in, and the tibia is now relocated. Complete anterior cruciate ligament tear mechanism, off in the air, awkward landing. So as we watch her landing, body's forward, momentum of her body is forward, her hip is in adduction and internal rotation, knee then is driven into valgus based on the proximal position of the body, and then to remain upright, her tibia initially externally rotates and her foot is pronated, and then in here, her ACL is torn as it looks ugly, and her tibia is anteriorly rotated, anteriorly dislocated. In the Miller game, I was shooting a free throw, and I missed it, and I was going to go get the rebound. And it was like for the court, it was like out of bounds. I was on the left, and I jumped up, I think, to get the rebound, and there was this girl behind me, and I brought it down, and I, I think I was on this knee, or my left knee, and I just felt it popped at least five times, and I went down. Here is her exam under anesthesia. Listening to her history, she obviously has torn her ACL. Anterior drawer is positive. Lockman has no endpoint. And her pivot shift, lateral tibial plateau goes anteriorly at 30 degrees to zero. The subluxation and the relocation test. Dislocated, reduced. Tibia anterior dislocation dis reduced. And you can see the clunk. Again, she's under anesthesia. This is very difficult to do in the office, but you might try it gently. Check the proximal tib-fib joint. Check the opposite side. Positive pivot shift in this acute ACL tear. Do this maneuver by axial loading the tibia, rotating. It's a finesse maneuver, not a brutane maneuver. Another basketball athlete, elite level, comes down, gets her rebound, comes down awkwardly, tears her ACL on the non-braced side. So she's shooting, very aggressive player. The parents in these situations oftentimes say if you'd made the basket, you wouldn't have torn your ACL. Sometimes the parents are not very um, supportive of why ACL injuries occur, so we must be the parents and the caring adults in situations like this. See, she grabs her knee to her chest, the heart attack of the knee or the ACL tear of the knee, and if we watch an injury like this occur or listen, as the patient uh, previously, whose parents really did say, if you had made the free throw, you wouldn't have torn your ACL, then we can make a diagnosis very easily based on history, anterior cruciate ligament tear. This individual is hot dogging uh, before uh, the game, uh, comes down awkwardly, points to the involved left knee. So he's off balance in the air, grabs the rim a little bit, doesn't come down two-footed, comes down awkwardly, all of his weight on his left side. And again, ACL tear, MCL, patella are normal. So the valgus is the anterior dislocation of the knee. Non-contact, taking the ball out of bounds, right knee, tears her ACL, not really thinking about things, has a little uh, mini stroke or uh, inability for her brain to uh, really control the muscle function around her knee, uh, not thinking, not prepared, tears her ACL, taking the ball out of bounds, all of her weight on the right side, leg is in, knee is in extension. So these instability patterns, we will see the lateral capsule avulsion, a Sagun fracture radiographically with a little tibial avulsion pull off. Very rarely, probably 1% of the time, but the capsule does have an injury to it, maybe not pulling off the bone. And this anterolateral rotatory instability, ACL is torn, so they have a pivot shift where the lateral tibial plateau subluxes anteriorly. That's their mechanism of injury, and hence the pivot shift maneuver. 
talking about this bird's eye view, you can have different degrees of ACL tear. Typically the ACL tear is torn all or nothing. However, the instability patterns may be graded on one through four, but in my experience, a pivot shift test is either positive or negative. We can have physiologic pivot glide maneuvers that are usually symmetrical, very common in female athletes. But think about the ACL as the central uh, stabilizing ligament and uh, the anterolateral rotatory instability as being acute or chronic in the greater than four months. Core mechanisms of injury with anatomy, surgical findings, and then the design of our lab studies. Uh, if you look in the upper left, anterior drawer test, that's what's happening arthroscopically on the upper right. And then again, the functional instability that we see is the anterolateral rotatory instability. The pivot, sublux now reduced, sublux now reduced. In the upper right, you can see the anterior cruciate ligament mop and tear, nothing connecting up into the femur. Lachman is our best test in the awake patient. The anterior drawer test, typically I'll sit on their foot and bring them forward, just like pulling a drawer out of a chest of drawers. Check them in neutral, internal, and external rotation. Pivot shift, patient is now subluxed anteriorly, and the clunk will be when they're reduced. Subluxed, reduced. Because of the bony anatomy, also in the awake patient, the IT band greater than 30 degrees of flexion, they reduce. A lot for the brain to think about, but think about the functional problems that the patients have without an ACL. And also some of our lab design studies, with gait lab and other analyses, we can look at their gait patterns, landing patterns, and hopefully design further prevention prehab programs. When we look at the pivot shift test, and the lateral compartment shown up on the upper right arthroscopically, there's a little indentation, not really a tear of the lateral meniscus. We see more lateral meniscus tears than medial and associated with an ACL tear. So we're reduced, subluxed, reduced, subluxed. And again, it's more of a rotation test with a little axial load. Put your body into it, reduced, subluxed, reduced, subluxed. The articular cartilage injury that we see rarely is in the lateral compartment, uh, but we do see bone bruises on the MRI scan very often, but only in about several percent of the time there'll be an articular cartilage injury. Looking at the popliteal hiatus, the popliteus tendon on the lateral side, and then we always look to see if there is an osteochondral injury of the lateral femoral condyle. The medial compartment has a lot more compression than that lateral compartment. See how much harder it is for us to get into the medial compartment? The medial compartment is difficult to get into because of all the compressive forces. If the foot is um, in, if the uh, lateral plateau is anterior, then a lot of compression posterior medially. So these compressive forces lead to medial meniscus tears. Uh, to get back here, we have to do a reverse pivot shift, externally rotate the foot and go into valgus. And you can see this peripheral tibial sided um, tear that fortunately is repairable early on. Later on it will become a bucket if they don't get fixed. But you can tell how difficult it is to get into this posterior medial compartment and that's really because the ACL is torn as well and the knee is in a subluxed position making it very difficult to get into that posterior medial aspect of the knee. So thinking about injury mechanisms, body positions, the position of safety shown on the left and the position of no return shown on the right, a concept that we wrote about in the Journal of Athletic Training 15 years ago. Think about the body alignment, that is the position of the joints and the back, and then the muscle activity, muscles and their agonist-antagonist function can work better if the joint is in a more flexed position for the hamstrings, for example. So the position of no return, we see the body alignment. As you have seen these mechanisms of injury, the body is a little more upright. So our body alignment rotated the opposite side. The hip is in adduction internal rotation. Knee is a little less flexed in valgus and to stay upright, the foot ends up being pronated and the tibia is externally rotated. 
the whip action of the ACL tear takes 70 milliseconds to tear the ACL. So it is difficult to know exactly when the ACL fails. There is rotation of the tibia on, a, on the femur or vice versa. If the foot is planted, it seems the tibia stays in neutral or external rotation and then the femur rotates internally then externally giving us the apparent valgus at the knee. If we think about muscle activity in the position of safety, if we are in a more flexed hip, flexed knee position, the hamstrings, a two muscle, two joint muscle, works at both the pelvis to the hip as well as the femur to the tibia in a more flexed knee position, the hamstrings, which do the same thing as the ACL, are going to be better able to prevent anterior tibial translation when we land. Unfortunately, not all sports are in a tennis get ready position. Tibial rotation, neutral is probably the best. The ACL tightens up with the tibia in internal rotation, but in the nature of these injuries, it seems like the landing starts with the foot pronated and the tibia is then in external rotation. Plantar flexures, gastrocnemius, and posterior tib are all good muscles to be working in prevention of ACL injuries. In my opinion, more important muscle function and body position is up at the hip. So in this position of no return, if the knee is more extended, the quadriceps are at a mechanical advantage. The dorsiflexors of the foot, perineals, and tibialis anterior of the tibia. And also, if the hip is in internal rotation and adduction, it's the hip flexors, adductor, and iliopsoas that takes over to drive the hip into further flexion, internal rotation, adduction. Team handball is very popular in Europe. There have been some great studies on team handball by Olson, Micklebust, Ingbertson, and Barr. They have looked with video analysis of the position of the lower extremity in these non-contact injuries. The court is a rubberized court. Oftentimes the foot gets stuck starting the cascade of the ACL injury. So the friction between the floor and the shoe is great. In their analyses of ACL injury and the player in the red tears her right anterior cruciate ligament. So they have cameras um, front and side view to analyze these mechanisms of injury looking particularly at the tibia, rotation, knee flexion. Again there's an assumption that they know when the ACL tears. In this injury you can see in the upper left she hasn't come down yet. She takes a couple of steps, lands in the upper middle picture, goes to rotate on the right, and then the lower left, she's probably torn her ACL at that point. And then she collapses into further knee flexion. The analysis of this is that the ACL occurred with the foot fixed and externally rotated in the lower left, wide stance. She's out of her cone of stability, so to speak. The tibia is 10 degrees internal rotated, the knee is in 20 degrees of valgus, and 15 degrees of flexion. So they postulate that the ACL injury occurred in the lower left, and I would agree. Other mechanism injury, shot on goal. She tears her left anterior cruciate ligament. You can see she's being guarded, lands one-footed. This analysis shows us that the ACL injury occurred somewhere between the upper right and left lower. The foot fixed and externally rotated. The knee was at 20 degrees of valgus. The tibia in this case was 10 degrees external rotated and the valgus of the knee is 10 degrees and the knee was flexed 20 degrees. Off balance in the air is a key then we can't control our landing and ACL tears occur. Soccer, non-contact, definitely the turf has something to do with this one. Goes into hyperextension. Again, offensive, had the ball, another player comes up. 
tears his ACL, but that's not just an ACL tear. That is also a posterior lateral corner injury, and you don't want to miss any posterior lateral corner injuries. Examination on the sideline is the best time immediately after the injury. Lateral instability. This individual football athlete got hit from the front. You can see the little skin abrasion. So in um, 30 degrees of flexion, he opens up in varus. Here's his anterior cruciate ligament tear with a anterior pivot shift. You can also have a reverse pivot shift. Anterior drawer is positive. And if you watch the lateral plateau, it comes forward, goes backwards. So he has both a pivot shift as well as a reverse pivot shift and has an anterior cruciate ligament tear and a posterior lateral corner injury. Acutely diagnosed, these can be repaired in some situations. Acute reconstructions can be done. But the most important thing is early appreciation of an associated posterior lateral corner injury or on the other side a medial injury that requires repair immediately if we only do the ACL in these injuries that have posterior lateral corner or medial instabilities, the ACL will fail and they will have to have a reconstruction, a revision ACL, and also a reconstruction of the medial or the posterior lateral side. So the main thing is if you have seen the play or talked to the coaches or the athlete, these may not hurt. You want to make sure that you check their perineal nerve function. As oftentimes there will be a perineal nerve palsy that you want to document before surgery certainly. So this is a posterior lateral instability as well as an anterior lateral instability. This is at the time of his ACL reconstruction and posterior lateral corner repair. We've already taken the ACL, uh, harvested the patellar tendon, ipsilateral, and we've passed that, not tied it down yet. So here's the IT band, tibialis anterior going through the fascia of the IT band. Perineal nerve is under the vessel loop. And then here's our injury to the posterior lateral corner. We're looking into the joint. That's the fibular head. The biceps femoris is avulsed. The IT band we've taken down to allow access into the lateral capsule. See the lateral meniscus and the tibial plateau, fibular head there, so he basically has a meniscus laterally that has been stripped of its um, meniscotibial and meniscofemoral ligamentous attachments. Biceps femoris is off the fibular head, and basically the posterior lateral corner structures are repaired acutely in this situation, done one week after his injury. This is uh, examiner anesthesia, or excuse me, is exam in the office. Three months after the injury, so you can see how he opens up a little bit. It's symmetrical with the opposite side. There's healed incisions. And if you remember what his exam was under anesthesia, you can see now that uh, he's got a stable exam, negative Lachman, negative pivot shift, and negative reverse pivot shift. Other posterior lateral corner injury um, tests would be uh, an external rotation recurvatum, opening in a varus stress, and a reverse pivot shift, all of which were negative in this individual post-op from a direct repair. So this was a combined anterolateral, posterolateral instability. The involved structures, ACL, PCL, is not involved in this case. Uh, posterior lateral corner is. And think about what you're doing with the exam, correlating with the mechanism of injury, and the involved structures that are torn. Sideline assessment of injuries. To make the diagnosis, you have to use your observation of the mechanism or talk to somebody who has seen the athlete injured. Physical exam, talk to the athlete about what hurt, how the injury occurred. If they have no pain, be concerned that it is a more severe injury. Make sure you do a neurovascular check in all cases, as well as a thorough ligamentous exam. You can make the diagnosis based on the history 
and physical exam acutely. This is uh, Jerry Rice, who I used as an individual who was very talented, had feet that moved rapidly, and he didn't tear his ACL until after he'd been in uh, the NFL for many, many years. He had a non-contact ACL tear. This was a billboard um, in Chicago that uh, one of my students uh, took a picture for me. It's to hell with an ACL, Jerry Rice. He came back very quickly from an anterior cruciate ligament tear. Injuries occur at all level levels of talent and experience. And if you play the sport long enough, perhaps ACL tears are inevitable, like playing in traffic. Jerry Rice had a stress fracture of his patella or a fracture of his patella three months after his ACL reconstruction which is a good example of if Jerry Rice can have a patellar event after an ACL reconstruction, then any athlete can. So I use him as an example in the office if athletes are trying to get back too quickly. Uh, there is more of a risk of patellar event and patellar tendonitis if they get back too quickly than re-injury. Female soccer athletes are at particularly high risk for re-injury, so I think that the return to play, getting back in a safe but not a fast way is the best approach. Who's having the sideline decision and return to play train? I think it should be the doctors, the physicians, surgeons who operate on these young men and women should be the ones calling the shots as far as when to get back to play. Not the parents, not the young athletes, not the coaches. Sometimes the trainers end up at the back of the bus or the back of the train in the caboose, but they certainly are at every level uh, in this train. They're on every car of the train. Um, and are the ones who really help communicate with all involved um, and keep the player safe and hopefully return to play safely without further injury or re-injury to the ACL. We, the physicians, surgeons, and the trainers should be making the decisions of return to play. The physicians and the trainers must communicate, must be on the same page, or there will be some coaches, athletes, and parents that will play us one against the other. The docs and the trainers need to be on the same communication page, always. Thank you for your attention. This ends the acute knee ligament injury in athletes.